Good evening, back in the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to finish up Matthew chapter 27. Remember, last night we studied how Christ was, he was led away to be crucified. They put the crown of thorns on him. They put the robe on him, mocking him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Which, And we know Jesus is not only King of the tribe of Judah, he's the King of all 12 tribes of Israel. And as, as we studied last night, we remember that we found out that he would say, Remember, there was darkness from noon until 3 p.m. And people were starting to realize, whoa, something supernatural is going on here. And at 3 p.m., Christ cried out, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatane, which means, my God, my God, why hast, for, why hast thou forsaken me? And many Christians have a hard time with this. They think that what God forsake Christ on the cross, well, first of all, we know that God is Emman Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. Christ is God in the flesh. And thankfully, we know that he was quoting Psalms 22. God did not forsake Christ. He was simply quoting Psalms 22. And in that Psalms 22, the very first verse is, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You get about down to the eighth verse, the eighth verse in that Psalms 22, and it says, He trusted in him, let God deliver him. That would be Matthew 27, verse 43 quoted. And then it would go on to say that they pierced my hands and my feet. They remember they nailed Christ's hands and his feet to the cross. Then in that Psalms 22, it would say that they parted my garments, then they, they gambled, they cast lots for my vesture. Exactly what the Roman soldiers did at the foot of the cross. So understand it was all, first of all, it was all written a thousand years before it ever even happened, down to the detail exactly how Christ would be crucified. So don't let anyone ever try to tell you that the Bible is just a book written by man. No, man could never accomplish that. That down to the detail would be written what would happen a thousand years later. We know the Holy Bible is it's written by God and the Holy Spirit, simply penned by man. And then that the very last verse of that Psalm 22 where it would say, He hath done this. That's the Aramaic equivalent to the Greek, it is finished which was the very last words that Christ said on the cross before his flesh body died. Proven to us, Christ taught the entire 22nd Psalm while he was on the cross. He taught up until the very last second until his flesh died and then he was taken back to the Father and the Spirit. But we do know that he, he went to the spirits in prison and preached unto them. And he brought so many people to that salvation who hadn't had the opportunity back in, his, back in history. So we're going to finish Psalms 27. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us all together so we can study your word and we can share it with others. And, and we thank you for giving us this building so we do have a place to come to share your word with others. And we ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit and to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand your word. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. So we left off in Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, verse 54. But I want I want you to remember uh, fit verse 51. I'm going to read it of Matthew 27. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. What does that mean? The veil was rent. That's the veil that separates the holy of holies, where the high priest would go in just one time of year. For the, for the forgiveness of all the sins that were not atoned for. So what that means, that veil was rent. You no longer need a high priest. You don't, you don't need a pastor, a priest between you and our Heavenly Father. You can come boldly into God and talk to Him anytime that you want to. Because that veil was rent. He is always there for you. All you have to do is seek Him. And this is written up in multiple parts. I want to go to one. It's Hebrews chapter 10. Where this is spoken of in, in great detail. Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to pick it up, verse 1. We have Hebrews right before the book of James, very close to the back of the Bible. So Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 reads, we're going to, this is going to talk about what Christ's crucifixion did for us. Verse Hebrews 10, 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. This is saying that the blood sacrifices did not get it done when it comes to the forgiveness of sins. 
We know that yes, this is this was God's plan for it to be the case before. But when Christ died, He became the sacrifice for one and all times. To where you don't have to sacrifice an animal. You don't need a high priest to go in between. You can simply come to God and ask for forgiveness. And it's, it is erased as if it never even existed when you ask for forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Verse 2, For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. He's saying if, if blood sacrifice was the way, it would have never stopped. But Jesus Christ is the way. Verse 3, But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. This is known as the Day of Atonement, and this is the day that the high priest would go in and he would make a sacrifice to, for all the sins to be forgiven that had been done all throughout the year that had not been forgiven yet. But see, we don't need that Day of Atonement anymore. We can ask for forgiveness any time. Every time we sin, we can ask for forgiveness. And we have a clean slate. And in Isaiah 43, 25, God even says, I will not even remember your sins when you repent to me. They're even, God even blots them out of His own mind. You, are, you have a clean slate until you sin again and then you repent again and you have a clean slate again. We all fall short. We all sin. But Christ died so we can have repentance and eternal life. Verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. The, the blood of animals did not get it done. Verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, speaking of Christ, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Christ would be the sacrifice for one and all times. Verse 6. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. And this is basically Hosea chapter 6, verse 6 quoted, where he's saying, I don't want your burnt offerings, I want your mercy, your love. That is what God seeks of you, is just to love Him. Verse 7. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Verse 8. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings, an offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither had his pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Verse 9, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. That is to say, the first covenant is done away with, and we are now in the second covenant, which is grace. That is not to say the law is done away with. Remember what Christ said. He said, I did not come to destroy the law. He said, not even one jot or tittle is taken away from the law. That means not even one apostrophe, not one letter is changed of the law. He came to fulfill the law. But what this is saying is that all the ordinances, the blood sacrifices are done away with. And we are now in that dispensation of grace where as soon as we repent of our sins, they are forgiven as if they never existed. That is the second covenant we are in now. Verse, verse 10. And remember, Galatians 3.24 says that the law was the schoolmaster to bring us unto Jesus Christ. And don't let anyone ever try to tell you that God changed. From the very beginning, it was always God's plan for it to happen exactly how it did. For the blood sacrifices to be first, and then for Christ to come in and be the sacrifice. That was all God's plan from the very beginning. Verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He became that one sacrifice for one and all times. It is sacrilegious for you to think that you, were, you would have to give a blood sacrifice. The blood was shed. All blood sacrifices are done away with. Not the law, but blood ordinances are done away with. Verse 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. The sacrifice of animals was not the way. It didn't get it done. Verse 12, But this man, Jesus Christ, you see the capital M, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God where Christ sits even today. Verse 13, From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Well, who gets, who gets that done? You make his enemies your footstool through the will of God. Because that is your job, to help others to bring them to the love of Christ. And to subdue Satan, because Satan has no power over you ever. You have that power over him in Christ's name. Verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And you are sanctified when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Verse 15. 
whereof the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts. See, the law isn't done away with. You are to keep the law in your heart. And in their minds I will write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. They're washed away upon repentance. And what is this from? This is quoting Jeremiah 31. It's an exact quote. So see, it was written of all the way back in the Old Testament that that new covenant would come. It was always written exactly like it would happen. And Scripture always comes to pass exactly as it is written. Verse 18. Now a remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Why is that? Because they're done away with. They're wiped clean when you repent. Verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, His flesh. This is where the veil comes in, that it was rent from top to bottom. You don't need a priest to go in between. You can boldly enter and talk to God at any time. It doesn't even have to be out loud. He knows your thoughts. You can talk to Him whenever you want to. He's always there for you. He loves to hear from you. And prayer, all you have to do is talk to God. That's all He wants from you is a relationship with you. Verse 21. And having an high priest over the house of God, Jesus Christ is the one high priest that we have. Verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That is the living water, Jesus Christ. He's sprinkled with, we're sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ, meaning that because that's how it was done back when the, sacri when the blood sacrifices were. They would take the blood, they would sprinkle it on the altar. But we are sprinkled with the blood of Christ, which gives us eternal life. Verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession or the acknowledgement of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. Yeah, hard times are going to come, and especially those of you that love God, that love Jesus Christ, Satan is going to be coming against you. But stay strong, don't waver, because God is always with you. Amen. Verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Remember, that's why we're here, to bring others to Jesus Christ and into that love and into that true peace that can only come from God. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Don't just go and be by yourself all the time. We are to come together in the love of Christ. As the manner of some is, but exhorting, that means inviting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What is that day? It's the day of the Lord, the day that Jesus Christ returns. And that day is approaching. You can see everything going down right now before your very eyes that it is written. But never forget the false Christ comes first, claiming to be Jesus Christ. Never forget that. The one that comes performing miracles that it's written in Revelation 13. That brings about that one world system, that one world peace, one world religion that seems so holy. It's the false God that brings that. Never forget that. Verse 26. Very important next two verses. So because some people would try to say, oh, now that we have Jesus Christ, we can just sin anytime we want. It, it doesn't matter. We're saved no matter what we do. They wouldn't have read these verses. Verse 26. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. You cannot sin willfully just because we are on that dispensation of grace. One more verse here, verse 27. But if you do that, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Judgment will come to those who decide not to follow God's law. Who think, oh, I, oh I'm saved, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm saved by Jesus Christ. But if they never read God's word, they wouldn't understand that it's the false Christ that comes first. And they fall right into Satan's hand because they never studied God's Word to read how the end times would come about. Okay, let's go back to Matthew 27. We'll finish up this chapter. Matthew chapter 27, right around verse 52 is where we're at. Matthew 27, verse 55 is where we left off last night. Matthew 27, 55. And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto Him. 
The women are still there. Remember, all, all the disciples, except for John, they all, they all scattered. Why? Because that was, that was what was written back in the book of Zechariah. It came to pass exactly like it was written, as God's Word always does. But these women, they, stuck, they stayed strong with Christ. Many times women are the strongest out of, out of all of us at times. Verse 56. Among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. That would be Salome, the mother of John, as we learn in other Gospels. And Mary Magdalene is such a strong disciple of Jesus Christ. Many people will try to falsely teach that she was a prostitute. Well, where's that written? I can tell you that's not written anywhere. That's a false doctrine. That is just a complete lie made up by man. She had seven evil spirits in Luke chapter 8 that Christ cast out of her. And she was one of the strongest disciples of Jesus Christ. Verse 57. When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. And this would even be Jesus' great uncle. This would be Mary's father's brother, Mary's uncle. And it's very interesting when, when you learn the history of Joseph of Arimathea. As it is written, this isn't biblical, this is in the history that Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea would take Jesus Christ as a teenager to Great Britain, to Glastonbury. And what they would do there is Joseph was a, he was a tin miner. And, and it is even thought that Jesus Christ taught Joseph how to mine, how to mine all that tin out. And Joseph became very wealthy. But see, it's not written in God's Word what happened to Jesus about the age between the ages of 12 and 30. Oftentimes what he was doing, he was going with Joseph of Arimathea to England. And that's what they were doing there. They were mining. They were getting that tin. Very likely Jesus Christ even taught them how to do it. Because He is Emmanuel, God with us. He knows all things. Verse 58. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. Why was he able to do this? Because th this was rightful by the law. He was the great uncle of Jesus Christ. So he had that right to claim the body. Verse 59. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had honed out in the rock. And he rolled a great piece, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre and departed. This would bring to pass Isaiah chapter 53, where it says that, that Jesus would, would be buried with the rich, meaning that in this tomb built, in this tomb built by the rich, Joseph of Arimathea. And it's also written in the other gospels that it was a tomb that no one had ever been in. Christ would be the first body to be put in this new tomb. Verse 61. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulchre. They were waiting that they wanted to they wanted to anoint Christ's body one more time before he would be buried. But they're thinking, see, they got this giant rock in front of it. They, they don't know what to do here. Verse 62. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that, that, that deceiver said. While he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. They heard what Christ said. This is what he said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. So this goes to show you that even, even the, the wicked people, they do, they hear the teaching of Christ when it is around them, and, and they often remember. And, and that is a good thing to know that when you plant seeds to others, when you share the truth of God's word, even if they act like they don't even care at the time. It might stick in their mind, and God may make that seed grow. So never be afraid to plant seeds of truth. You never know. It is not your job to make the seed grow. You plant the seed. God makes the seed grow. Mm -hmm. Even these wicked people, they, they knew what Christ had said, and they're starting to get worried. They're afraid it's actually going to come to pass. Verse 64, Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away. And say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last heir shall be worse than the first. He's saying that if Christ does resurrect from the dead, he's saying this is even this would be even a worse thing than what we already did. We already killed a just man. We we aren't really sure if he is the Messiah, but we know that he was innocent. But him resurrecting from the dead would ensure that he is the Messiah, he is the Christ. And they will do everything they possibly can to make people not think that that happened. 
We're going to learn in this next chapter, chapter 28, that even to this day, the Jews, and I'll say the false Jews, they even say to this day that Christ's body was stolen away. That's obviously not true. He was resurrected as it is written. Verse 65, Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. Saying, you, you had this mob that came after Jesus. I know that Jesus is a just man. Remember, he washed his hands clean of the whole situation. Even though Pilate was not a religious man, he, he could tell that Christ was innocent. So he's saying, I'm not going to do that. You have a little army. You go figure it out. Verse 66 is complete. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. They put a seal on this stone so they would be able to tell if someone were to, had broken the seal. They would know that if someone did come and steal Christ's body. But as we're going to learn in the next chapter, the angel of the Lord is going to come and roll that stone away and Christ is resurrected. So we'll, we'll finish Matthew chapter 28 tomorrow, the, the last chapter of this book of Matthew. Such an exciting book that started all the way back from the, the birth of Jesus Christ up until His crucifixion and His resurrection. So we'll finish that. Never forget that God is always with you. And when you have the love of Jesus Christ, remember He died for you. He literally died on the cross. And I think many people underestimate the pain that He actually went through. He died a slow, painful death while His arms and His feet were pierced with, with giant nails on the cross. He died a slow, painful death. He did that for all of us so we could have eternal life. That All we have to do is repent. And our sins are wiped away as if they never existed. The greatest thing anybody ever did for anyone. We thank our Father for it. Let's go to His throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank You for sending Your Son to die for us on the cross so we can inherit eternal life. And and we thank You for guiding us with the written Word. And we thank You for the written Word so that we can understand what happened in the, in the history so we can be ready for what is to happen to us even in the future today. And we thank You for giving us this place that we can come and fellowship in Your name and share Your Word. And we ask You just to continually guide us so we can share Your Word with others and be pleasing to You, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. This is recorded at Smyrna Christian Church, 1623 North Purdom, Kokomo, Indiana. Come join Pastor Jesse Sisk on Wednesday, Thursdays, and Fridays at 7 p.m. and Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. God bless.